If you were a soldier wounded in the Great War, lying in the cratered and muddied morass of no man's land, it might have been easy to lose hope. Many of those wounded would crawl as best they could, trying to find some cover from the enemy snipers and the weather, only hoping that they could be found by a friendly medic. But medics in that war had a unique way to find those lost and injured men. One that came on four legs, carrying a pack with medical supplies and maybe a drink. And if that soldier was unable to return on their own, the four-legged friend might leave and return with a doctor in tow, all without uttering a single bark. Dogs have accompanied men into war for probably most of human history, but the Great War was the first war where they were used in an official and broad capacity to find wounded men. Mercy dogs, which were also known as casualty dogs or ambulance dogs, were used on all sides in the First World War, and they saved thousands of lives. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Dogs, of course, have been widely used by armies throughout history. There are depictions of dogs straining on their leashes as far back as the ancient Assyrians, although it isn't clear whether they were used in combat. Certainly dogs, especially mastiffs and other large breeds like the Molossian Hound, have been used in combat since antiquity. Alexander the Great took dogs with him across Asia, and the Celts and Romans both seem to have used dogs widely in combat. Of course, dogs were used for much more than actual combat. They could be used to protect an army's supply of livestock, as well as warn the camp of spies or an ambush. They were especially useful for sentry duty, as they can sense threats and disturbances in the dark that others simply miss. They have been and continue to be used in special support roles, sniffing out bombs, foes, and the wounded. At the outset of the First World War, it was the latter that became their most important job. With the exception of England, all the European belligerents had military dog programs active at the outset of the war. Industrialization made even the largest dog less useful as a combatant, as no amount of specialty designed armor was going to protect a dog from a bomb or a bullet. In the 1800s, Germany began training what they called Zanitatsunde, or sanitary dogs, whose job was to find the wounded and the dying among the dead after a battle. Among the earliest was a program put together by animal painter Jean Bungartz in 1895, which was described as a novel experiment. By 1908, Italy, Austria, and France had created their own programs to train mercy dogs. Germany had around 6,000 trained mercy dogs by the outbreak of the war, and may have used as many as 30,000 dogs in various roles throughout the war. Mercy dogs were given the unenviable job of locating the wounded in the chaos after a battle. They could distinguish between the dead and the dying, and proved to be incredibly capable of triaging the men they found. One military surgeon praised the dog, saying, They sometimes lead us to the bodies we think have no life in them, but when we bring them back to the doctors, they always find a spark. It is purely a matter of their instinct, which is far more effective than man's reasoning powers. These dogs would often be outfitted with saddlebags that carried some medical supplies like bandages and liquor so that an injured soldier could drink to numb the pain or apply medical aid. Primarily, the dog's job was to find the wounded where no one else could. Wounded soldiers often crawled away from combat to find some place to hide where they would often be missed by soldiers coming the field after a battle. The dogs weren't fooled, and they easily found soldiers hidden in the mud and the carnage. They were often trained to carry something of the soldier back, like a piece of a uniform or a belt or even a helmet, to indicate that they'd found someone, although some were trained instead to return with an attached leash in their mouth instead, as some of the dogs would actually tear off bandages in their mission to help the wounded. It wasn't just the belligerent governments that used dogs for these purposes. Various National Red Cross groups trained dogs to help locate wounded soldiers as well. These dogs became known by a variety of names. Medical dogs, ambulance dogs, casualty dogs, and of course, mercy dogs. Many breeds of dog were used, but some were more prominent than others. In the early days, the Germans preferred English breeds, especially collies and English shepherds of various kinds. One of the most popular were Airedale Terriers, also commonly used as police dogs before the German Shepherd became popular. German Shepherds and Doberman Pinschers were also common. Other than a general belief that the best dogs were purebreds, as many breeds served. German trainers also tried poodles, which turned out to be unsuitable because they are short-sighted, as well as St. Bernard's in pointers. Dogs saw service on all sides and all fronts of the war. On the Western Front, the Germans used as many as 30,000 and the Allied powers 20,000 in support roles. It took longer for the Allied powers to embrace their use. France developed ambulance dog training before the war, but the first English training center didn't open until 1917. 
The most important single man in the English war dog effort was Colonel Edwin Richardson, an early proponent who had been training dogs for war and ambulance work before anyone else in England, and who helped train and educate militaries around the world on their use. At least two dogs he trained, Carlo and Robbie, served as ambulance dogs in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. Richardson assisted the French, Belgian, and even consulted with Americans before the war on the use of dogs in war, but only one support after two of his Airedales, Wolf and Prince, served with distinction as messenger dogs at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. The Americans never fully developed a war dog program, although an 1896 article in the U.S. Journal of the Military Service Institution reviewed Germany's success and admonished that we have the best dogs, the greatest number of dog shows and dog enthusiasts, but had failed to even try to match the German program. Though a program never appeared, thousands of American dogs were donated to the Red Cross for use as ambulance dogs. Colonel Richardson said that the dogs were best used when the army was moving and that they were nearly useless on the static western front, claiming that the only ambulance dogs that were used with any success were those with the German army when the Russians were retreating. Despite this claim, there are countless anecdotal stories of dogs on the western front performing as ambulance dogs. The French army found that the Red Cross symbol the dogs wore was often ignored, and soldiers on both sides freely shot at the dogs doing humanitarian work. The dogs were kept behind friendly lines in large kennels, and handlers were sent to the front to assist Red Cross doctors and nurses in locating soldiers lost on the battlefield. Because they were often made targets, despite their kind mission, they were usually used at the end of large battles and at night, when soldiers could search for the wounded and using lights would only attract enemy fire. They were incredibly good at their jobs. The journal of one German Red Cross worker describes working with his dog less than 400 meters from French lines and finding in short order five wounded, three severely wounded, and two slightly wounded, which even with the sharpest eyesight you could not have found. French dogs were described as returning from the lines to their kennel, then to bark and turn back to indicate they had found a soldier. The soldiers could be found at the bottom of deep ravines and other sequestered places, so well hidden that it could take a whole day to get the soldier free. The dogs, unaware of the larger causes for the war and innocent of it, still served with an incredible bravery and commitment. One French dog called Prusko was credited with saving more than a hundred men. In one battle he saved three badly wounded men by allowing them to grab onto his collar one at a time and physically drag them to safety. Another dog called Steif was given the Iron Cross when he charged onto the field to rescue a German lieutenant shot in a failed attack. Steif grasped the lieutenant's coat between his teeth and, foot by foot, dragged him to safety. Steiff was shot at least twice in the rescue attempt, but recovered with the soldier he had rescued. Perhaps the most famous dog who served with the Americans was Sergeant Stubby. Stubby was of uncertain breed. Contemporary news described him as a Boston Terrier or a kind of Terrier mutt. He was found on the Yale University campus and adopted by the 102nd Infantry as a mascot after one soldier smuggled him onto the ship bound for France. But Stubby proved he was more than capable of doing his part. Though he was not trained as a mercy dog, he was said to have located and rescued numerous soldiers, as well as warned his unit of incoming artillery and gas attacks. He was wounded several times, given a specially made gas mask, and sewn a coat that held his various awards. His title of sergeant was not in jest, either. After attacking a German spy, he was put in for, and given, the rank of sergeant. Of course, there are many other anecdotes about the heroism of these dogs, with names like Rags. In addition to locating and rescuing soldiers, the Mercy Dogs were also known to find soldiers who were too wounded to be saved. Many of these dogs remained with the dying soldiers, providing them with some comfort in a situation bereft of it, and making sure that those wounded men did not die alone. Mercy Dogs also became a symbol of patriotism. An American military recruitment poster with the image of a dog wearing a red cross says, Even a dog enlists. Why not you? A young girl who sent her dog to be trained by Colonel Richardson wrote that we have let Daddy go to fight the Kaiser, and now we are sending Jack to do his bit. A Frenchman wrote, I already have three sons and a son-in-law with the colors. Now I give up my dog, and vive la France. They were widely depicted in propaganda as steadfast heroes on the front and were included on the covers of the Saturday Evening Post and Red Cross magazine. They were elevated to heroic levels and attributed human emotions and characteristics. Of course, like the soldiers, they suffered for their service. Shell shock, now recognized as a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder, was first recognized during the Great War, and certainly affected dogs as well as humans. It is estimated that 7,000 dogs were killed in the war. It's not known how many wounded soldiers' lives were saved by the mercy dogs of the Great War, but there is firm evidence that the number is at least in the thousands, including at least 4,000 Germans and 2,000 French troops.
And in addition to mercy dogs, they also were used to deliver messages, which they could do faster than any human, as well as to serve as scouts and sentries. Mercy dogs continued to be used throughout the 20th century, in the Second World War, and by the U.S. in the Korean War. Today, search and rescue dogs are used to find injured and trapped people after natural disasters. Despite the human tendency to anthropomorphize animals, of course dogs know nothing of patriotism and politics. The war must have been as terrifying to them as it was to the wounded soldiers that they were sent out to find the risk of their own life. And yet they served in the Great War without question, saving lives and easing human suffering. It is important for us to recognize that service, to thank them, truly, man's best friend. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>